Now, if you would, uh, take your Bible, uh, Bibles with me and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. We kind of got stuck in chapter 9, didn't we? We've been there for a while. Um, We're going to pick up with verse 37 and read down to verse 43 of Luke, chapter 9. Now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. Suddenly, a man from the multitude cried out saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. And we'll stop there. All right, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have tonight again to open up, to consider your word. And we plead with you, our Father, for your glory's sake, for the glory of your Son, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and that you would empower your word to the heart of every person here tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, in our last message uh, in Luke, uh, we finished a consideration of the revelation of Christ's glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. We, We spent quite a bit of time there on the mountain with Jesus and the disciples opening up that passage. It was truly what we might call a mountaintop experience for both our Lord and the three disciples who were with him. But now it's the next day, and they've come down from the mountain, and what they meet with is a terrible, distressing situation. A demon-possessed boy, the only son of a greatly distraught, heartbroken father, disciples who are powerless to do anything about it, and all sad reminders of the fallen state of this world, which for our Lord and for us as well is difficult to bear as we dwell among a faithless and perverse generation, as Jesus puts it in verse 41, quoting a phrase from Deuteronomy 32.5. So the mountaintop experience is followed by the valley of distress, and this is often the case in our Christian lives, our Christian pilgrimage in this sin-cursed world. Indeed, we we should learn to expect it. The glory of the final state is not yet. Until then, mountaintop experiences are not the norm and are few and far between. Now is the time of conflict with sin and with the forces of darkness. And it's interesting that this is not the first time this contrast occurs in the Bible. When Moses, you may remember when Moses came down from meeting with God in all of his majesty on Mount Sinai, he was confronted with the sound of rebellion and idolatrous dancing around the golden calf. When Elijah came down from his exhilarating triumph over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, where the uh, the fire of heaven fell, he was immediately met with the strutting arrogance and threats of the wicked Jezebel. Well, as Jeff Thomas has put it, commenting on the scene before us, when Jesus came down from the mouth of transfiguration, his wonderful memories of that occasion were shattered by the shout of a father crying for his only child who was being destroyed by the devil. That's the scenario. A journey from the mouth of transfiguration to the valley of the devil, from a foretaste of heaven to the troubles hell is causing in our world. Now, you may know that this is is an event uh, that's also recorded in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Mark. 
but Luke's account is shorter, it's more streamlined, and it can be very helpful to compare his account with the two others to help us to see what aspects of this event the Holy Spirit, through Luke, desires to emphasize in this particular context. For example, Luke, like Matthew, does not include the conversation in Mark between Christ and the Father of the demon-possessed boy, a conversation, remember, when Jesus asked him, how long has the boy been in this condition, and in which he also encourages the boy's father to have faith. And you remember the father says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Luke doesn't record that. Also, unlike both Matthew and Mark, Luke does not record the conversation Jesus had with his disciples after this event, in which he tells them why they were unsuccessful in casting out the demon themselves. And in those accounts, he censures their lack of faith, and he also points out that this kind comes out by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now, clearly, Luke, or the Holy Spirit through Luke, is not concerned with highlighting that issue in this particular record. But there are some small and yet important features of Luke's account that the other two do not have or that only Luke and Mark, to some degree, draw attention to. And some of these are the ones that I want to focus on this evening. First, only Luke mentions that this boy was his father's only son, and that the father based his appeal to Jesus partly on that fact. And only Luke tells us that when the boy was cured, Jesus gave him back to his father. And then also, only Luke... And in part Mark to some degree, but not 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 in in such a a direct and intense manner, uh, draws attention to the fact of what immediately happened when this boy was brought to Jesus. And only Luke describes this in the very striking manner in which we see it in our text. And it seems to me that he deliberately uh, draws attention to this in the way he says it in verse 42. He says, and as he was still coming... The demon threw him down and convulsed him. As he was still coming to Jesus, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Well, with these unique features of of Luke's account in mind, I want us to consider this evening in the time remaining the boy's condition, the father's distress and recourse, the devil's resistance, and the Savior's deliverance. So there's our simple outline tonight. Let's consider, first of all, the boy's condition. And very simply... The text tells us that the boy was demon-possessed. And this was an unusually difficult case of demon possession. We're told in verse 39 that the spirit was seizing the boy, and he would suddenly cry out, and it would convulse him, and he would foam at the mouth, very much like an epileptic seizure, and it scarcely ever departed from him. The word translated with great difficulty means scarcely or hardly with difficulty, and it would bruise him presumably by throwing him down as he does later or causing him to thrash about and harm himself. Mark adds that the demon often threw the boy into fire and water trying to kill him. So this poor boy is in very serious shape. It's a desperate situation. The unusually difficult nature of his case is also seen in the fact that the disciples... Jesus had left below when he was on the mount with the other three. They were unable to cast the demon out. They tried, but they couldn't do it. Now, they did so on other occasions, but this case was different. It was more difficult, and they were not successful. And you may remember in Matthew and Mark's account, when Jesus spoke to them later about their failure, he told them, this kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, think about the implications of those words, this kind. Well, we're reminded by those words that there are various kinds, various degrees of evil power and influence. On other occasions, they had been successful, but not with this kind. There are differences and degrees, and this was a particularly difficult case. Now, let me just remind us of some things about demon possession that I've had occasion to comment on already in our study of the Gospel of Luke, just to remind you of them. The question is often asked, can people still be possessed with demons today? Yes, I think it still happens, though it's not common. It's, in fact, never been common. In fact, there are only four references to demon possession 
in the whole of the Bible outside of the gospel records of Christ's life. But it seems that when Jesus came and walked as a man in Galilee and Judea and in nearby areas, there was this tremendous increase in overt demonic activity. And and you can see why. Jesus is in one place, in one location, geographical location in the world at that time. And Satan throughout all stops in his efforts against Christ. Now, I don't think this is to be expected to be the norm. But having said that, we must also remember that the Bible teaches that all who are outside of Jesus Christ are under the devil's sway. That doesn't mean that everyone who is not a believer is demon-possessed. However, the Bible does teach that everyone who is not born again is under Satan's dominion. We're told, for example, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, that Satan, the god of this age, has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Paul, in Ephesians 2.2, describes the condition of all of us by nature before our conversion. And he says there, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which he once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, speaking of Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So Satan and his demonic emissaries are still active in the world, and every person who is not in Christ is under his dominion and power. And I also remind you that one of the ways The healings Jesus performed and his casting out of demons are described in the New Testament is they're called signs. That means a sign is something that signifies something else, something that is pointing to something. Well, they they are signs pointing to spiritual realities and to the salvation from sin that Christ has come to provide for sinners. Therefore, in this demon-possessed boy, we also have a picture, an illustration of a lost soul enslaved to sin and under the devil's dominion. It's a picture of every man by nature who is outside of Christ, and it's a picture of a very difficult case. Someone who is being ruined and jerked about here and there and overcome by worldly desires and sinful passions. So we have the boy's condition. And then notice, secondly, his father's distress and recourse. And again, here is where Luke records some details that are not mentioned by Matthew or Mark. He mentions in verse 38 that this boy was his father's only son. And you'll notice that this was part of his appeal when he brought the case to Christ. He said, teacher, I implore you or I beg you, look on my son. For he is my only son. And then only Luke mentions at the end of the narrative after the boy was delivered and Jesus gave him back to his father. So clearly the Holy Spirit is drawing attention here to the family dynamic. And I think there's a world of meaning and emotion really that's captured in those words. We're reminded of the unique, the, the unique affection of a father for his son and of the tragic effects of this boy's condition upon their relationship. His condition has taken him away from a happy relationship with his dad. And just imagine how this father felt as he saw his precious son in such a condition, wallowing in the dirt, out of control, crying out, engaging in self-destructive behavior, staring up at his dad with glazed eyes over eyes certainly he remembered the joy of his heart when his son was born the dreams he had had of the wonderful times that they would spend together in the special relationship that they would enjoy as a father and a son but it's all been ruined by the grip of this evil power over his son's body and life And later, one of the wonderful outcomes of this boy's deliverance is not just the salvation itself, but one of the things that was included in that salvation is Jesus gave him back to his father. The enjoyment of that relationship was restored to them. And I'm sure there are parents uh, in this room tonight who can sympathize with the agony of this father for his son. You have children who are in the far country. 
quoting from J.C. Ryle. There are many Christian fathers and mothers who are just as miserable about their children as the man of whom we are reading. The son who was once the desire of their eyes and in whom their lives were bound up turns out a spendthrift, a profligate, and a companion of sinners. The daughter who was once the flower of the family and of whom they said, this shall be the comfort of our old age, becomes self-willed, worldly-minded, and a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. Their hearts are well-nigh broken. The iron seems to enter into their souls. The devil appears to triumph over them and rob them of their choicest jewels. They are ready to cry, I shall go to the grave sorrowing. What good shall my life do to me? Some of you parents can very much uh, relate to those feelings. Some of you young people here tonight, you have no idea the kind of sorrow and anguish that you bring to your parents. Someone has said, I never knew how much my parents loved me until I became a parent myself. And I found that to be so true. And those of us parents uh, who had Christian parents, we could also add that I also never knew how much distress my parents felt for the salvation of my soul until I became a parent myself. But parents, there's something else here in the example of this father. The condition of his son was very bad. It was desperate. Probably most would have said that his son was beyond hope, but he wasn't. And his father did the right thing. What did he do? He did what you must do for that lost son or daughter of yours. He went to Jesus and he cried to Jesus about his child. Lord, please, I beg you, look on my son for he is my only child. And he told Jesus all about it. What was happening to the boy, his behavior, what he was doing, the grip that Satan had upon his son's soul. He told it all to Jesus and he cried to him for help. And this is what you must do uh, for your lost children. And this passage should encourage you that Christ listens to the distressed cries of Christian parents for their lost sons and daughters. So don't give up. Keep praying. Quoting Ryle again. Now, what should a father or mother do in a case like this? They should do as the man before us did. They should go to Jesus in prayer and cry to him about their child. They should spread before the merciful Savior the tale of their sorrows and entreat him to help them. Great is the power of prayer and intercession. The child of many prayers shall seldom be cast away. God's time of conversion may not be ours. He may think fit to prove our faith by keeping us long waiting, but so long as a child lives and a parent prays, we have no right to despair about a child's soul. Amen. Well, we've considered the boy's condition and his father's distress and recourse. Notice with me now, thirdly, the devil's resistance. The devil's resistance. Now, good things are happening, right? And Jesus is on the scene. He tells the boy's dad, bring your son here. And then we read verse 42, and as he, and it's not talking now about the dad, that pronoun is referring to the boy. It's talking about the boy. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. So the boy himself is now coming to Jesus. So our hope is awakened. We're encouraged here. There's good signs. The boy is, is coming to Jesus. Friends are helping him, and he's coming. He's getting near to the Savior. There's good signs. He's getting near to the one who can cure him. But the devil doesn't give up easily. And as he was still coming, he's not there yet. But he's moving in that direction. But while he was still coming, suddenly the devil throws him down and convulses him. He's cast down, thrown about, dashed to and fro, and almost torn to pieces. And what a picture we have here of what often happens when a sinner is coming to Christ. Perhaps there's someone here tonight, 
And you're to some degree awakened to your need of Christ. And there's been a desire awakened in your heart to want to be a Christian. And you're concerned about your soul. And we might say you're coming, but you're miserable and afraid. And Satan is having his way with you. Spurgeon has a sermon on this text entitled, The Comer's Conflict with Satan, in which he draws out and develops this truth that here we have a striking illustration of what sometimes happens to sinners who are coming to Jesus for salvation. Satan puts up an awful fight, and he causes them to be thrown about with agonies and fears of various kinds. And it's true. Many of us, many of us know this from our own experience, don't we? There's mystery here, but the Bible makes it very clear that Satan and evil spirits in some unexplained way, do have the power at times to make suggestions and to interject thoughts into the minds of men. That's very safe scriptural grounds when I say that. For example, we're told in 1 Chronicles 21.1 that Satan moved David to number the people. It said of Judas' betrayal of Christ that the devil put it into his mind to betray him. John 13, 2, the same is said of Ananias in Acts 5, 3, where Peter said to him, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And there are other texts that demonstrate this. And there are what the apostle Paul refers to in Ephesians 6 as the fiery darts of the wicked one. He says in Ephesians 6, 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of of the wicked one. So there are these fiery darts that Satan hurls at us, and he does this in many ways, working together with the the tendencies already of our hearts. And sometimes how do we separate the two? Well, you don't necessarily have to separate the two. Sometimes it's a combination of both. But what are some of these ways? Let me just mention some of them, and perhaps the Lord will bless this to the soul of, of someone here tonight. First of all, one of the ways this happens is by causing confusion about biblical truths and doctrines. Satan and his hordes know the Bible very well. He's a, he's a great theologian. He's a better theologian than John Calvin, believe it or not. He's a great theologian. He knows the Bible like the back of his hand. He's a very sound theologian, though his heart is pure wickedness. And he can take even true doctrine and pervert it in such a way as to keep the coming soul in darkness and despair. And one of those doctrines is the doctrine of election. Oh, haven't you heard the preacher talk about the doctrine of election? God has chosen from eternity a people to be saved. But here's the problem. You're not one of God's elect. Why would God elect you? If you were one of God's elect, you wouldn't be struggling like this. There's no use coming to Christ when you may not be elect. Well, my friend, listen, the doctrine of election is never intended to discourage anyone from coming to Christ. It's a doctrine of grace. It's all about God's grace. It's not about God keeping people from being saved who otherwise would have been. It's about God saving people who otherwise would not have been. If it weren't for election... No one would come to Christ. And whether you think yourself to be one of God's elect or not, the gospel tells you what you must do. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Come to him for salvation. And Jesus has promised that him who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. And my friend, listen, anyone and everyone, whoever they are, who comes to Jesus Christ for salvation is one of God's elect. Oh, but what about the doctrine of particular redemption? We just heard about that. You remember that? The devil says, it's true, Christ died for sinners, but not for you. He died for those God has chosen to save, and you're not one of them. Well, put it back to him this way. He died for any sinner who comes to Christ for mercy. And that means if I'm coming to Christ, he died for me. Indeed, God in the gospel freely and sincerely offers Christ to all. 
in all of the glory of his person, in all of the sufficiency of his atoning work, and his blood is sufficient to cleanse anyone from their sins who comes to him, including you. And listen, by the free invitation of the gospel that he gives to all, God has given you a warrant to come with the assurance that he will save you. Now, what's that mean, a warrant? Well, when the, when the police comes to your door with a, we won't talk about no-knock warrants. That's kind of a, a problem today, isn't it? But when he comes to your door with a warrant, what does that mean? Well, that means that he has the permission, the legal right to enter your house. He's been given a search warrant, let's say. That's what it means. When we talk about the warrant of faith, the warrant of faith is God's invitation to come. His command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And his promise that if you come, he will receive you. That is the warrant of faith. Think of it as a ticket. It's the same idea. Think of a ticket. If I have a ticket to the football game, all right, a Boca Christian football game, I have a ticket. It would be foolish for me to be worrying about whether I'm ordained or elected to get in or not. No, I just need to go to the stadium with my ticket and walk in. Well, God gives you a ticket in the gospel to come to Christ. And you're to go to Christ because you're commanded and invited to come with the confidence that you will be received. You've been given a ticket from God himself. Christ is able to save to the uttermost all, all who come to God by him and he has promised that whoever comes he will by no means cast them out but the second way that satan will throw sinners down and toss them toss them about who are coming to christ is by making them think that their sins are too great to be forgiven you know it's very interesting many of you know this from your experience that as long as he keeps us asleep in a kind of uh, insensitivity, a kind of false security, he doesn't really trouble us very much about our sins. He minimizes them. They're small and insignificant. Everybody does it. Don't worry about it. Just forget about it. But as soon as a sinner is awakened in some measure to the evil of his sin and to his need and starts coming to Christ, Satan then turns the table and he takes the opposite tactic. And he tells you that your sins are so great and so wretched and so dirty and so wicked that there's no hope for you. Past sins are brought before your mind in all of their shameful details. All the people you've hurt, those foul and impure deeds in the dark of the night, the lies, the deceit, the ingratitude, the lustful indulgence, the hypocrisy, sins against light and knowledge. You knew better, but you did it anyway. Now, the Holy Spirit also, when he's bringing us to Christ, he begins to show us all of our sins, doesn't he? He shows us our need and how desperately we need him. But the Holy Spirit shows you these things to lead you to Christ. But Satan will beat you up with them and throw you down, and toss you about, and tell you that God could never love a person like you, and that Christ will never receive a person like you. Your sins are too great, and too many, and too heinous. Well, my friend, what, what, do, you, what do you say to that? Well, the scripture says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Sinners. He didn't come to save good people. He came to save bad people. He came to save deep, dark, dyed-in-the-wool sinners, real sinners. So if you're a sinner, well, that means you're qualified. You're just the person Christ came to save. And Jesus said that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men who come to him for mercy. So don't ever dare think that your sins are greater than the infinite value of the shed blood of the very Son of God himself. His death and his blood is of infinite worth because he's not merely a man. He is the God-man. 
The Son of God and His death for sinners is abundantly sufficient to pay the price God's justice demands for any sin and any sinner, whoever they might be. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Somehow we get it into our head that He came to save righteous people. He came to save sinners. So when Satan beats you over the head with your sins... And he reminds you of what a sinner you are. You turn that argument against him and say, yes, you're right. Don't try to argue with him and say, no, I'm not as bad as, as that. No, just say yes. In fact, I'm worse. I'll never forget reading about George Whitfield and somebody wrote a letter to him and they listed out all of these problems they saw in him. You're, pri- you're prideful, you're this, you're this. And you know what he did? He wrote him back and he said, yes, and there's a lot of other things that are about me that you don't even know about. And he wrote a whole bunch of things that they didn't even know about, about himself that were bad and sinful. Well, you see, you say to, to Satan, you're right, I'm a sinner, but Christ came to save sinners. So I run to him. And in that way, you see, you take the very sword by which he attacks you and you cut off his head with it. You see? A third way Satan or his emissaries sometimes torment the sinner who is coming to Christ is by questioning whether you're really coming to Christ at all. He'll cause you to obsess over the question of whether you have any faith. And he'll get you to keep looking within at your faith or your lack of faith or the weakness of your faith and focusing on trying to work up in yourself this thing called faith. But listen, it's not your faith that saves you. It is Christ who saves you. Faith is not the object of our faith. Christ is. You're not to look at your faith for comfort and salvation, but to Christ and his work alone. That's what faith is. The Bible speaks of weak faith and strong faith, great faith and little faith. But praise God, it's not the strength of your faith that saves you. It's what or who your faith is is in if two people get on a boat that's delivering them from an island that's seeking into the water to take them to the continent one may be scared to death when they step on that boat and trembling and fearful and thinking man i don't know if this boat's going to really hold me up or i'm i'm really not sure if i stepped on the boat in the proper way or not another person may step on the boat and they're immediately filled with assurance but which which of the two people are the safest Well, they're equally safe because it's not the strength of their faith that saved them. It's the boat, right? Christ is the Savior. It doesn't matter if your faith is weak and feeble. You find yourself attacked by many doubts and fears because it's not the strength of your faith. It's who your faith is in. Therefore, if what little bit of faith you may have, what tiny little bit of hope you have is in Christ, in Christ alone. He will. In fact, he has saved you. But there's a fourth and very dreadful way in which Satan will sometimes throw down and tear up and toss about a coming sinner. Sometimes he'll fill the sinner's mind with weird and shocking thoughts. The soul is coming to Christ, but these evil thoughts seem to be attacking and darting into your mind, maybe even blasphemous thoughts or atheistic thoughts, doubts about the very fundamentals of the Christian faith, or as weird as it may sound, maybe no one will relate to this, but maybe some of you will. He he can even make you doubt your own existence. Is this world even real? Do I even really exist? It may be grotesque and perverted things that you've never thought about before. And these awful thoughts are assaulting your mind like a swarm of flies. And you're shocked and you're terrified and you're convinced that you've become an apostate. And there's no hope for you. Now listen, I'm not saying that this happens to everyone. Because Satan will use that against you and say, well, that never happened to you, so you must not be a Christian. I'm not not saying that this happens to everyone or listen, in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Christian didn't, Christiana didn't go through the slough of despond, did she? She went straight to the gate. And there's, 
and she, I'll tell you this, she should have went straight to the cross, but that's a whole other story, right? So everyone's experience is, is different, okay? So I'm not saying that this happens to everyone. I'm not saying that any of the things that I've mentioned have happened to everyone who has come to Christ, but it has happened to some and many, I would say. And evil spirits will interject these thoughts and whip you with them and tell you that you're beyond hope. He wants you to focus on these thoughts and to dwell on them and to feel depressed and miserable and distracted and hopeless. Well, what are you to do? Well, there's an old saying that goes, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from nesting in your hair. Or let me put it this way to anyone who may be struggling with this. Let me ask you a question. Can you honestly say that you hate these thoughts and you regard them as evil and despicable? Can you say that? Well, if so, my friend, let me encourage you that there is no need for you to be walking around feeling condemned and miserable and hopeless. You say, ah, but I'm afraid my heart may have consented to some of those thoughts. And there was some sin there. Well, even so, if there was, if you condemn those thoughts and judge them before God as wicked and evil and look to Christ for mercy, God doesn't condemn you. It's the devil who is throwing you down and convulsing you that God condemns. And even if there was some mixture of sin in it, the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cleanse you from all iniquity as you look to him for mercy. And there's one other way that I'll mention that the devil sometimes harasses and throws down the sinner who is coming to Christ. Fifthly, sometimes those who are coming to Christ or even who have already come to Christ are harassed by the fear that they'll not be able to hold out. They're afraid that they'll eventually go right back to the wretched, miserable state that they were in before I'm afraid it won't last and I'll return like a dog to its vomit and I'll be a hypocrite and I'll bring shame upon myself and upon the gospel. Why should I come to Christ and follow him and risk bringing embarrassment and shame upon myself and upon the gospel because I eventually just turn around and go right back to it again into the same state again? Well, what's the answer to that temptation? Well, God's word promises that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6. Christ is able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God by him. What does that mean, the uttermost? That word uttermost means that Christ is able to save them fully and completely from beginning all the way to the very end. And in the new covenant... God has sworn with an oath to all who come to Christ that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Spurgeon tells a story from the life of one of the great Welsh preachers, Christmas Evans. He was a one-eyed preacher. He had one of his eyes, he didn't, was not there. But anyway, <laughs> he, he, was a great, he was a Baptist. He was a great Baptist Welsh preacher, Christmas Evans. And Evans was once describing in a sermon the prodigal sons coming back to the father's house. And he imagines in his sermon that when the prodigal sat at the father's table, his father put upon his plate all of the tastiest bits of meat that he could find. But the son sat there and did not eat. And every now and then the tears would begin to flow. His father turned to him and said, My dear son, why are you unhappy? You spoil the feasting. Do you not know that I love you? Have I not joyfully received you? Yes, he said, Dear father, you are very kind. But have you really forgiven me? Have you forgiven me altogether? so that you will never be angry with me for what I have done. His father looked upon him with tender love and said, I have blotted out your sins and iniquities and will remember them no more against you. Eat, my dear son. 
The father turned and waited on the guests, but by and by his eyes were on the boy again, and there was his son weeping again, but not eating. Come, dear child, said his father. Come, why are you still mourning? What is it that you want? Bursting into a flood of tears the second time, the son said, Father, am I always to remain here? Will you never turn me out? The father replied, No, my child, you shall go no more out forever, for a son abides forever. Still the son did not enjoy the banquet. There was still something troubling and something, something rankling. And again he wept. Then his father said, Now tell me, tell me, my dear son, all that is in your heart. What do you desire more? The son answered, Father, I'm afraid, lest if I were left to myself, I might play the prodigal again. Oh, constrain me to stay here forever. The father said, I will put my fear in your heart, and you will not depart from me. Ah, the son said, it is enough. And my dear friend here this evening, this is what the father promises to you and to all who come and are coming to Christ. Don't let the devil keep you from Christ by fearing otherwise. What if I fall into great sin? God will not allow you to abide in it. But by the same power with which he saved you in the first place, he will bring you to repentance. And he will keep you in the way of faith and devotion to Christ to the very end. It's all of God. It's all of grace. Well, these are at least a few of the devices by which Satan sometimes casts down and convulses and hinders the sinner who is coming to Christ. There are other things that we could talk about, and maybe there's something, and you're thinking, yeah, but you didn't really touch on my situation. Well, come talk to me. Come and talk to me. We'll talk about it, whatever it may be. But praise God, Christ is more powerful than the the devil. And he is able to deliver us from his clutches. We consider the boy's condition, the father's distress and recourse, and Satan's resistance. And now finally, we have the Savior's deliverance. The text says, and as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Jesus rebuked him. Christ is more powerful than Satan or his evil spirits, and he can do what no one else can do. He could do what the disciples couldn't do. He could do what even the boy's father couldn't do. He could do what no one else could do. He has power over Satan and power over sin. Grieving father here, discouraged mother, he can save your wayward child in a moment. Don't give up. Keep praying for that son or that daughter. And my friend who is, who is coming to Christ but tossed to and fro with fears and confusion and doubts and harassing thoughts, Jesus is able to deliver you. And he will in due time if you don't lose heart and give up in despair. He has his purposes. He has his purposes even in allowing the devil to throw you down and convulse you for a time. Perhaps he's preparing you to one day be better able to minister to others. Right? In a similar condition with the same comfort by which you yourself have been comforted. But whatever happens, still be coming to Christ. And when the eye of faith is dim... Hold to Jesus, sink or swim. And eventually the clouds will begin to lift. Perhaps you've been hoping that some counselor or some pastor will deliver you. But my friend, look to Christ. The disciples couldn't do it, right? They could do it. His own dad, as much as he wanted to, he couldn't do it. It's the Lord who rebuked the unclean spirit and delivered the child. He can do it, and only he can do it. Look to him. Now, you hear that language a lot here. You'll hear me say it a lot. Look to him. What's that mean? What does that mean practically, to look to him? It means 
Think about him as he is revealed to us in God's holy word. How does God reveal Christ to us? Is it some kind of uh, strike of lightning that hits us? No, he reveals Christ to us in his word. Look at him in his word. Think about him, his glory, his goodness, his power, his kindness, his grace. Prayer is good. Self-examination has its place. Pastors and counselors can help and have their place. But the way to overcome Satan and to have peace with God and peace in your heart is to look to Christ. Think about him as he's revealed in Scripture. Look at him revealed in the Gospels, full of compassion toward needy sinners. Go to Gethsemane. Go there and, and look at him there, praying in agony and covered with blood, willing to accept the cup of divine wrath that you deserve in order that you might go free. Go to the cross where he suffered and fully paid the price once and for all that justice demands for all of your sins and go to the empty tomb where he rose from the dead, proving that God accepted his sacrifice. Hear him cry, it is finished. It is done. It's dealt with. It's put away. And listen to his promises. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He who believes on me shall never perish, but shall have everlasting life. Him who comes to me, I will by no means, that means for no reason ever, 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 him that comes to me, I will by no means cast out. You see, one of the things Satan does, one of the ways you can recognize it, Satan also the un unbelieving tendencies of your own heart. He wants to turn you inward upon yourself. He wants you only looking at yourself and not at Christ. Now, there's a, there's a place to look at ourselves, but for every time we look at ourselves, we need to look at Christ 10 times. He wants you to only look at yourself. I'm too sinful. You're looking at yourself. My mind is full of wicked thoughts. You're looking at yourself. I fear I don't have faith. You're looking at yourself. I fear I haven't repented enough. You're looking at yourself. Listen, repentance and faith go together, right? You won't ever repent without believing. Like, think about, the, 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 think about the, this, this young man here. What if he came to Christ and said, please save me, but I really want to continue to be, you know, demon-possessed? No, in the very act of coming to Christ, he's, he's acknowledging his desire, right, to be freed from demon possession, to be freed from the life that he was in, right? There's repentance. You see, when a sinner comes to Christ for salvation from sin, from the guilt and power of sin, implied in that is repentance, right? So I don't know if I've repented enough. Well, you're never going to repent enough. We'll always have room to repent over our best repentance. Repentance is not our Savior. Christ is our Savior. His blood even covers the deficiencies of our repentance. You're looking at yourself. I'm afraid I'll fall away and be a hypocrite in the end. You're looking at yourself. Well, I don't feel anything. You're looking at yourself. I, I don't have very much joy. You're looking at yourself. I don't feel very much of anything as I ought to feel. You're looking at yourself. My dear friend, quit <clears throat> focusing all your attention on yourself and upon your thoughts and your sins and your feelings or lack of feelings and focus, focus your attention on Jesus Christ. His perfect righteousness is for you. His shed blood is for you. His kindness, his love, his mercy, his death, his resurrection, his promises are for you. And he doesn't ask you to feel anything or to do anything to save yourself. He does all the saving himself. Just fall down before him, helpless, 
and look up to him for mercy. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And he will. For it was for this reason that he came into the world and suffered and died on the cross and rose again. It was to save helpless, wretched sinners like you and me who look to him for mercy as our only trust and our only hope. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. May he do the same for someone under the sound of my voice this very evening. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word, and we commit everything that's been said tonight to you. We pray that you would bless it to the souls of those who have heard, especially those, Lord, who may be themselves coming to Christ and yet troubled with all of these unnecessary fears. Please calm their fears. Lord, we pray that even tonight they might be encouraged and helped to simply trust in you. Thank you, Father. We pray for our children. Some of us have lost children. We bring them to you like the Father in the story that we read did And we pray that you would look upon our child. And we pray that you would pity him or her and have mercy and please save them. We ask it in Jesus' name.